Wow. Um, well, good morning. And uh, thank all of you for uh, coming here today and for uh, being part of this. Particularly, I'd like to uh, out Cheryl again. because I give, uh, Cheryl's an amazing woman who had a, a vision to uh, bring the 140 conference to Vancouver. Um, and she did everything possible to make it happen. What she didn't realize is that by her reaching out and bringing it here, it kind of fulfilled my dream, too, of seeing people who were passionate um, to bring events to their own city. So it's sort of uh, two dreams coming true at once. A little bit about the 140 conferences. Uh, these are events I created a uh, format a few years ago. I had for a number of years, actually over a decade, uh, created an event series called Vaughn, which helped popularize voice on the internet. Along the way, I started a company called Vaughn Edge. Um, I've done a lot of different things, but when I was doing the conferences, I used to, and if, if you've ever been to events, we had four or five or six breakout sessions that lasted several days, and you see a friend on a Monday and say, I'll see you during the conference and never see them again, because probably you and that person were in different tracks at the same time and you never saw them. So I made it a point that if I ever do an event again, I'm going to have one common experience, one shared stage. And when I discovered that the average attention span was like 11 minutes, why in the world would I do sessions that lasted an hour and 20 minutes? It just, I never got that. So that's the fast format. Uh, the idea really is to be focused and to share and to encourage people. Uh, the 140 conferences, we have people who've never spoken publicly before, so be kind. Uh, there are people here because they're passionate about something and sharing that passion with you. Uh, hopefully what you'll also discover are the people in the room. Uh, the, one, of the one of the key takeaways from these events is something called hybrid vigor which is a farming term. If we were farmers and we had crops from two different geographies who managed to somehow have an, have an offspring, that's, that's called hybrid vigor. At the, these events, it's the people you're sitting next to, the seat, people you're sitting in front of and behind, who you maybe have nothing in common with. What you'll discover is you have a lot in common with because you're here. And the relationships that are formed and, and the connections that are made, that's, that's really the offspring of this conference. And this is why I do these events. Because underneath this, we're all people and we're going through life experiences. And whether you're from emergency, you know, emergency services, whether you're from the tech industry, it doesn't really matter, because at the end of the day, we have feelings, we're individuals, we have experiences. And the 140 conferences have actually, what I've discovered are such things as serendipity, humanity, and love. Things that you don't really think about at these types of events, but when you start to hear some people's stories, you start to realize we all have something in common. Me particularly, I happen to have grown up uh, with a, being an amateur radio operator. I don't know if there are any hams in the room here. Perhaps there are some. But you know, when I was nine years old, I was pretty damn lonely. And my, uh, my father told me to contact my uncle, um, go to his office. And I had no idea why I was going on a tour of someone's office when I was nine years old. And it wasn't until I went into his office in his office and he had a little box that he turned it on and I turned the dial and I started hearing some squeaky voices coming from it. And then I started to get fascinated by this little thing. And my uncle sat there and said, CQ, CQ, this is K2QQ, I'm calling CQ. Nothing but silence. And then he repeats this. And all of a sudden, there's a roar of voices reaching out to my uncle. And I was there for an hour and a half just transfixed on the fact that my uncle would sit there, talk to total strangers, and have these like, connections. And so I got hooked. It took me three and a half years to get it, become a, get it licensed. But when I was 12 and a half, I got my license. And I've never shut up since. Uh, I, I, in fact, I grew up on the radio, and uh, my, my work in voice over IP came from being a ham and my, my fascination to communicate. And, and then I was there also in times of emergency. I was there to help relay messages. I was there to help whatever I could possibly do. And you fast forward all these years later into Twitter. I, I got involved in Twitter because I liked to, to communicate, and I use it to, for four things, to listen, to connect, to share, and engage with someone. And you know, I, I think I learned everything I needed to know about social media by the time I was 14 or 15. Because if you're on a radio talking to strangers from around the world, if you're not listening to the person, there's no conversation. If you're not engaging, there's no conversation. If you have nothing to share, there's no conversation. And, and there's just a, a level. And these are people who I never met mostly. But there were feelings shared. And I could tune the radio dial and hear a friendly voice and sit there and listen to these people talk for hours at times, never butt in. And other times, I could just talk and say hi. And that's how I approached Twitter. And, then, and I just discovered something real and something vibrant there. And so when I started doing these 140 conferences, you know, the, the one thing that I know, through the ham radio, it's really one to many, one to one and one to many conversations. But if I'm saying something on the radio, it's not necessarily being rebroadcast by anonymous strangers to the world. One of the magical things that happened with Twitter is this ability for your voice to be amplified and to be shared. And what we actually are experiencing is a time, a, a real, we're going through a social revolution these, today. 
the last few years. This is a revolution as big as communism, fascism, Marxism, whateverism. I really don't want to call it Twitterism because that'd be too self-serving. But we're living in a moment in time that um, the world became flat, access to information has become democratized. And if you think about it, you know, this revolution will cha is changing the way we are working and living. It, it, is, it, it is a revolution, though, not about we the people, but about me the people. And it's the voices of the individual me's that are making a difference in this world. And these individual people who otherwise never had a platform, never could be heard, just takes one person to amplify your voice, and that person's voice gets amplified, and so on and so on. And all of a sudden, you have a movement, and you change the world, and you make the world an interesting and sometimes much better place. Uh, through the 140 conferences, I was very fortunate to make friends with uh, NBC journalist and now co-anchor of the Today Show, Ann Curry, or soon co-anchor. And um, uh, back in January in 2010, when the Haiti Haitian earthquake ha hit, uh, Ann was on the ground a few days after the earthquake. And as a ham operator, I so wanted to do something meaningful. But as a, uh, not having a radio in my house, I knew nothing what to do. But I was sitting there at my kitchen table watching these tweets, and all of a sudden, Ann puts out a tweet. Um, apparently, the backstory was the U.S. Air Force had just taken control of the runway in uh, Port-au-Prince, and uh, Doctors Without Borders, which is a wonderful organization, had planes, I think three of them, cargo planes with doctors and supplies, and they couldn't land. So what does Ann Curry, a journalist, try to do? She does, uh, since she sends out one tweet at you, to at U.S. Air Force to help let, asking them to help let Doctors Without Borders land their plane. Me and maybe 10,000 other people just retweeted that. You know, I took her message, I wrote, retweet her message at U.S. Air Force, please let Doctors Without Borders land their plane. To my absolute utter surprise, within a minute of that tweet, comes another tweet at U.S. Air Force, at Jeff Pulver, we're on it. Now you think about this, there's an international crisis going on in Haiti. Somebody claiming to be U.S. Air Force, to be the U.S. Air Force is talking to me, a civilian in New York. Uh, and then they're on this. So I said, okay, maybe it's a, maybe it's a robot. Hmm. Hour later, at U.S. Air Force, at Jeff Pulver, the plane has landed. Ooh, okay. I said, thank you. Two days later, on my Twitter, I got an email, at U.S. Air Force is following you. I said, oh, I, 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 I checked this out. I, I, I saw that at the time they were following 27 people. White House, I understand. Uh, Southern Command, I get. U.S. Army, I got that. And me. Whoa, so I sent a DM. I said, uh, where are you? The Pentagon. <laughs> oh, and, and next thing I know, I'm having this chat with someone in the Pentagon. It's like, whoa, and uh, it just was a surreal experience because I now have a friend in the Pentagon and uh, I've gotten to connect with these, all these different people. Uh, around the same time, uh, seven days later actually, a friend of mine and several friends of mine, the Israelis came to Haiti to help out. They set up the first mobile um, hospital. And uh, one of my friends uh, was deployed there, I just happened to know personally, and his commander was in Tel Aviv, and they were running this live mashup between, on Google, uh, using Google to validate the origins of tweets, because, uh, and they were actually, his commander was looking for people tweeting for, to do search and rescue. So 10 days after the earthquake, which is a long time, a, a renowned journalist tweeted that a certain area in Haiti that was known for uh, having a bodega that was totally demolished, there was someone screaming. So my friend's commander validated it, sent my friend over with his team. Sure enough, there's screams out of this area. Someone was screaming, leave me alone, leave me alone. The back story is that this used to be a bodega, had two parts, a food section and an alcohol, a liquor store section. Apparently for 10 days, this guy was stuck in the liquor store. Uh, <laughs> but I saw this video and sure enough, my friend came in with his team and saved someone's life based on a tweet. And there was a case where military is actually looking to Twitter and civilians and, and just connecting, and the world has changed. And you're living in a time where the state of now is changing everything we do. You don't have to be in civil service. You don't have to be in emergency. You can be an individual with a passion, and you have a stage to be seen, to be heard, to connect with the world. I thank everyone for coming here and listening. I hope you make some new friends. I'm at Jeff Pulver on Twitter. I'm usually around in mornings. Just say hi. I'm happy to talk to you. I like to do that. I also like to share hugs at the 140 conferences. It's usually hugs over handshakes. I find that to be uh, just a more civil way to communicate and connect. Anyway, thanks for your time. I really thank Cheryl for uh, making this dream happen. And I look forward to being a part of this conference and to uh, meeting many of you uh, as the day goes on. Thanks for your time, guys. And uh, welcome to Vancouver, Washington.